No, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be back at Mobilism. I was here at the last, last Mobilism in 2013. Um, and I, I love the event. Um, if this really is going to be the last one, then you know, hats off to the staff because this was, it was an event that was ahead of its time in many ways throughout the years. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to be in Amsterdam. I like Amsterdam. I don't get to Amsterdam very often. Uh, this is, in fact, only the second time, both times for this event. Um, because I, I have four kids at home, uh, four kids under the age of six. And uh, judging by a few of the, uh, the heads to the palms and, and things that I saw there, um, I'm guessing a few of you are wondering why I don't travel more. Uh, but actually, you know, having kids running around, I think, has a lot of benefits. So for one, I think it's greatly increased my capacity for drinking. Um, I'm not, before you judge me, I'm not saying they drive me to drink. Um, not on most days. What I am saying is that um, there, there was a study a little while back that said that uh, lack of sleep or insufficient sleep had similar impacts on your brain as being intoxicated which means that for the last six years, I've basically been stumbling around drunk. Um, so when I go out and have a couple extra drinks at the end of the night, it doesn't really get any worse than this. Um, that's encouraging for what's coming next. No, but you know, kids are great. And what I love about them is I love their perspective. They have this incredible vision of the world, this incredibly per, uh, unique perspective. And uh, it's one that you kind of remember seeing the world through those lenses at one point in time, but you just can't quite grab a hold of it anymore. Uh, we live in... Uh, a part of the United States where there's not many people, um, but there is a lot of wildlife. It's beautiful. There's gorgeous trees and lakes everywhere. This is a shot from, and by this I mean, this is a shot from just down the road. Um, and there's trails that go on each of these, uh, along all of these things, and kind of guide you past the lakes and the, the trees. And you get to look out at all the wildlife. Um, and it really is just beautiful and serene. And we used to live right on one of these trails. And so going for walks was a daily occurrence. My oldest was at the time two to three years old. Uh, and she would put her baby doll in a stroller. And I would put her baby sister in a stroller. And we would head out. And we'd basically go as long as her sister would stay asleep or as long as she didn't get tired and start crying, we had to turn around. Um, but even in such a peaceful setting, uh, I, I guess this is a bad characteristic of me, but um, I was still driven. There was a part of the path that was particularly beautiful. It was similar to this. There was a huge lake, and you kind of came up over the lake, and you were just kind of looking out at all the wildlife. There was a lot of deer in the area, and bald eagles flying around. It was just beautiful. And I loved that part of the path. It was my favorite part. Uh, the only problem was that to get there, it was a little ways away. So if I had my kids with me, that was about the limit for as far as we could go. And we, the only time we got there is if we actually kept moving pretty quickly. Those of you with young kids or who have had young kids understand the flaw in this already, and that's that if you are traveling somewhere with little kids, you never go directly from point A to point B very quickly. Um, for those of you who don't have uh, young kids, I tried to figure out how to explain it, and it, it, I guess it would be like this. So imagine at the end of the conference, we have a few drinks out here, and then if some of us decide that we're going to go do like an after party at a pub, right? It's pretty logical. That's probably going to happen. But in order to do it, we each have to corral and herd a group of like 10 to 12 squirrels each and get them to the pub successfully as well. That's exactly what it's like going for walks with little kids. Uh, my daughter would stop every two to three feet and she would look at everything from the leaves to the acorns to the pine cones, rocks, ants, dirt, yes, even the dirt. Um, things that I looked at and I was like, this is really mundane and boring and trivial, but she'd pick these things up and she'd look at me with these eyes that were just wide as saucers in amazement at what she had just found. And she'd call these things her treasures. Uh, in fact, her siblings do this too. They call these things their treasures and they bring them home and they put them in little boxes and they carry them around very proudly. And every once in a while when they're feeling really generous, they might give one to their sister, which is like the greatest honor possible. Like you've just gotten one of these amazing artifacts. They have this dramatically different view of the world and it significantly alters the way that they interact with the world and the objects around them. I try to keep this in mind when I'm working on the web, because particularly with a Western world perspective, we have a very picturesque view of what it means to use the web. You know, we have these really powerful machines. We have, you know, top-notch phones. Uh, some of us have tablets, phones, e-readers, and laptops, you know, and maybe a desktop at home that we're toggling between depending on what we want to use it for. Uh, for the most part, our connection speeds are pretty good. Uh, data may be a little bit more expensive than we'd like to pay, but it's not something we can't afford. It seems pretty reasonable. We have this very picturesque view of the web, and because of that, it significantly shapes the way that we view technology. And so we're quick to dismiss things that don't make sense to us because they don't fit inside of our view. Not too long ago, on, uh, there was a discussion, one of those really well 
thought out, calm, even toned discussions that Twitter is so good for. Um, somebody said, kind of in passing, you know, Opera Mini is this browser um, that was edited. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say who this person is because I like this person and he's a very smart developer and I consider him a friend. Um, so I really don't want to call Dave out on stage. But what I, I also don't want to, I don't also want to name him because uh, it, this is something that I don't just hear from, you know, it wasn't just him. I've heard this in various forms from people who have to uh, design or develop for these browsers. You know, as soon as you fire these things up, you know, anything from Opera Mountain, U, U, UC Mini, uh, you know, it's just proxy browsers in general are crappy browsers. Um, they don't behave in ways that we're used to things behaving. You know, they do things that a typical modern browser doesn't do, and frankly, we don't understand. And we don't really have a need to use them on a day-to-day -day basis, so we don't necessarily get the purpose for them as well. So we tend to undervalue them, and we dismiss them uh, as troublesome relics from a web gone by. And, and it shapes the way that we build for the web. You know, Flipboard did this crazy thing where they re-implemented basically the entire DOM inside of Canvas to get these silky smooth animations. Um, you know, but if you fired that up on a proxy browser like Opera Mini, that, it, well, it was smooth scrolling, I suppose. Um, nothing getting in the way. Uh, Angular, you know, and other client-side MV frameworks are super popular, even on mobile, um, which I have opinions on. But, um, but, you know, as Jeremy Keith pointed out, he was, you know, you can't really browse the web using Angular, you know, on these devices as well. Uh, there was actually a bug filed on Angular about, you know, hey, can you do something about Opera Mini? And their response was that, I'm not sure uh, if it's possible or even worth doing, so they just kind of closed it down. I kind of agree with the possible without server-side rendering. I kind of disagree with the worth. Um, you saw this slide in Stephanie's amazing talk um, from the morning. And this was showing, you know, inter internet population and penetration around the world. And the takeaway being that the areas with the highest saturation are the areas we're used to kind of developing for and testing for and living in. Uh, where traffic growth is going to come from is these other parts of the world that we're, that's a little bit beyond our perspective. I worked on a project for Radio Free Europe last year, <laughs> and they hit about 70 different countries in, uh, in a lot of these different uh, emerging markets, these areas where the penetration rates are pretty low, where they've got a lot of growth. Um, and they have a very significantly different technological landscape for a variety of reasons. Uh, when we looked through their analytics data in terms of what devices are being used, you know, we saw some iPhones and Android devices. Uh, we saw a ton of these, though. Um, in fact, if you looked at mobile browsers, you know, they were coming from devices like this and they were running things like OV Browser and Opera Mini. You know, they weren't the things we were used to having developed for. And these are devices that we would hesitate to call smart by our own definition. Uh, this has no 3G, no Wi-Fi, no touch, 240 pixels and 64 megabytes internal memory. That is a super machine. Um, but it was really popular in a lot of the areas that they hit. And it was really popular because it was good enough, as Stephanie talked about the good enough technology. It's good enough, and it was affordable, and it got them online. Uh, we also looked at a lot of the connectivity. Uh, it's, it's tough to get decent data on the connectivity because a lot of people don't want to share some of those things because they can reflect poorly. But Akamai tries to uh, track like average bandwidth and, and stuff by country. And if you start to plot that out, you see some very interesting things. Um, there's definitely a wide variety. But what the real eye-opener is, is if you look at these places here, you know, Denmark, US, Netherlands, this is where the bulk of the people here, and myself included, because I wanted to do that. Um, this is where we live, this is where we work. We're the places with about 10 times, on average, the bandwidth of a place of, you know, Pakistan or Iran or India. You know, two, uh, two, two and a half times the bandwidth as China. Um, you know, it's a significantly different perspective in terms of the connectivity and the connection speeds that we get to use. If you dig down deeper, it gets even more, like you start to find out even more details that just highlight how different we have it. Uh, this is an article from when Pakistan uh, rolled out, or they auctioned off the ability for operators to put up 3G networks. Um, and they, they were really excited about this, and they talked about the amazing speeds of 3G and the power that that would give them. Um, this is from April of last year, and they were just auctioning off the right to put up these networks. Um, you know, meanwhile, in the US, people are you know, chomping at the bit for 5G or whatever the heck is going to come next. Uh, and if other areas of the world are any sort of indication, it's going to take a while for this to catch on. Uh, in Iran, they first got 3G connection in 2011. A full two years later, they had hit 0.1% penetration. 0.1% in two years. Uh, 
Uh, fixed broadband at the time wasn't any better at 16%. Uh, this stuff moves slowly in some of these markets, a lot more slowly than we're used to. Um, Iran is actually really interesting because it's an example of how religious and political barriers can cause problems as well. Uh, recently, a grand ayatollah stated that high-speed connections, access to high-speed connectivity like 3G connections, are against human and moral standards. Uh, in, <laughs> I know, right? It's something that's really, we almost laugh because it's that a level of absurdity, but this is what you know, a lot of these areas are having to deal with. In places like Iran and many other countries, authorities and government officials often uh, throttle the connection speed because it's a way of controlling the flow of information. Uh, that flow of information is a very powerful thing. And in places like this, the web becomes a battleground and speed becomes the primary weapon in that battle. You know, we talk a lot about how quickly things load or how much things weigh in a perspective. And we always view at it from like a dollars and cents thing, which makes a lot of sense, I guess. But um, in a, many places around the world, those factors, how quickly something loads or how much it weighs, can actually indicate whether or not a person can get online at all. Um, our internet is very different than the internet of many of these places. Our internet is not their internet. And we end up with this, 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 this friction, this tension, um, because of our different perspectives. See, the, I firmly believe that the power of the web is its ubiquity, it's its reach. That's the one thing that the web does better than just about everything else out there. Uh, universal access is a foundational principle of the web. Uh, it's an important one, too. It's so important that in 2012... Uh, the United Nations declared that access to the internet was a fundamental human right worth protecting and preserving. It's a big deal. So on the one hand, we have the web's power, what the web's you know, unique skill is. On the other hand, we have the capabilities of the web, what the browsers are becoming capable of doing, which is increasing at a re remarkable pace. Browsers are iterating because of the auto-updating and everything else at a pace we've never seen before. And you know, we rip on things like this with the, you know, the fancy... Dom inside of a canvas thing, but the fact that they can do this at all is pretty remarkable if, you, if you're going to admit, you know, um, I would never do this personally, but it's pretty fantastic they were able to pull it off. This is something we couldn't even dream of doing a couple years ago. And our response to these increased capabilities and then this fat technology that we have access to has been to throw more stuff at things. We throw more JavaScript, more images, we just keep piling things onto our pages and they become bigger and bigger and bloated. Uh, the average site is up, or average page is up to 2,000K now, um, which is heavy. That's a big deal. And, and in fact, this highlights another in, uh, difference from our world, our vision of the web and others, is that the cost of that data, um, if you look at that compared to like a typical moda, mobile plan, not roaming, just like what they're paying for raw data on a mobile plan around the world, there are places where that's hitting like 8 to 7% of the daily gross national income per capita. That's talking about like, you know, if you get $10 in a day, they're, you know, I mean, that's, that's a big hit. Um, and in many places, some of these sites that we've, I've loaded up and tested, the cost of the site itself exceeds the, the poverty level of 1.25. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of millions of people in some of these areas where certain sites on the web would cost more to load than they would make in a single day. Um, that's mind numbing. This is, it's a very difficult thing for me to wrap my head around. Um, but it, it creates that tension, that friction between what the web, the potential of the web, the power, and what it's capable of doing. Um, the capabilities of the web are pushing at the very limits of our imagination, but the reality is lagging a little bit behind. I love that little guy. And uh, no cat pics, I'm all about the dogs. Um, and proxy browsers, proxy browsers exist kind of in that gap. They try, they're trying to bridge that gap between what we're throwing into these pages and, and, and trying to give that ubiquity back to people. Um, and they're widely used. Rather than dismissing them, there's actually heavy traffic for these in many places. Um, UC is reporting 100 million daily active users. Uh, they claim 42% market share in India and about 35% market share in China. Uh, they're growing in other areas as well, but some of that, to be fair, is like, you know, 400% of one is four kind of a thing. Um, but, you know, they, they've got big funding from Alibaba, um, who, you know, Stephanie talked about some of the things that they're doing. Um, you know, they, they've, uh, they're being backed by that. Now, they've got an aggressive localization strategy that's been working really well for them, and they're trying to hit different markets like Russia very hard and, and Japan as well. Um, and so far, like, when they seem to go after a market, they've been doing a pretty good job of it. Um, so, you know, you can't necessarily dismiss them. And, of course, Opera Mini is the one that everybody likes to talk about. They have 250 million uh, active users in January and 168 billion pages transcoded. 
it's something like 21 or 22 peta petabytes of data. It's like some absurd number. Um, newer than both of these, uh, Puffin is a relatively new one on the scene. And they're not big on mobile devices yet, and they're still kind of growing a little bit in the tablet sphere. But they are amongst the top tablet browsers in about 40 countries. Um, and they did recently get another round of venture funding for, I don't know, I mean, to be fair, everybody's getting venture funding nowadays. But it shows that there's still some interest in what they have to offer. And we're going to get to them later, because they do some pretty interesting things. Um, so when I was trying to prepare for this talk and figuring out what to talk about, there's so many different proxy browsers. Uh, but thankfully, Sentient Mobile's Mover Report has a lot of stats in it where you can get some information about what proxy browsers are used uh, in, the, uh, you know, in what countries and, and what the market share is. Um, and just kind of plotting out what the most popular ones are by area. Um, you know, I kind of picked basically from this list. Those are the, you know, it's the things you expect. The Opera Mini, uh, the Chrome, Turbo, Ovi Browser, Puffin, Silk, UC Web. Silk, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, Silk, in theory, does some very interesting things. But I had an uh, incredibly hard time trying to replicate them and make them happen on my own uh, devices. And I tried to talk to people within the Silk team and... I didn't have any luck with that. So um, they were not very helpful. So um, I don't want to talk about it just because I would be speculating, because I had a hard time reproducing the behavior that they, they claim to be doing. Um, but we'll focus on some of the other ones. And I, I kind of categorize these. I put them off into two buckets. There's like the conservative proxy browsers, maybe even more of a service sort of a thing. Uh, these are things like Chrome's Data Saver, uh, UC Web's Cloud Boost, uh, Opera Turbo. Um, and then the aggressive sort of things. This is where an OV browser or Nokia Express um, kind of fits in, Opera Mini, UC Mini, and Puffin. And before we get into what these two types of proxy browsers do, it's important to understand what a typical modern browser does so that we can understand the difference in behavior because um, they do differ pretty significantly. So on a typical browser, you type a domain name inside your mobile device and press enter, and it has to resolve that domain name to an IP address somewhere. And once it has the IP address, it goes off and it pings that server and it starts getting the assets that it needs to load that page. And it continues to do this throughout the duration of the page load. Uh, while this is going on, it's trying to parse the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript. Um, it needs to figure out what it's going to put on a page. It needs to create a document object model and a CSS object model. So a model of all the elements within a page and all of the selectors that might be applied to those elements. Uh, it can... It combines these to create a render tree, figuring out what actually needs to be rendered on that page. Uh, and then does layout, basically think of it as like shoving little boxes and figuring out what sizes and where things are going to sit, uh, and finally painting it onto the screen. That's a fairly high level thing. Some of the names of the steps differ from browser to browser. Um, there's also some detours and other additional things, but it's a decent way to look at it for our purposes. Um, you can separate these things out a little bit. You can say that the stuff on the left is primarily constrained by the network. Um, these are things, you know, how quickly these requests take place and, and the amount of data, those things are primarily bound by things like the cost of data, the latency, the bandwidth. The stuff on the right is more constrained by the device. These are things based on the power of the device, so like CPU and memory and things like that come into play here. Proxy browsers focus on optimizing for one or both of these areas. Uh, the conservative ones focus primarily on the network. That's what their major concern is, just saving you data. Um, I mentioned Chrome Data Saver, which you can use on, on Chrome Mobile. There's an unofficial extension for desktop that you can use, but it has a few quirks. There's also going to be an official extension if their uh, bug in, internal bug thing, filing system and stuff is any indication there. They haven't announced anything formally, but they're very clearly making you know, tweaks and filing bugs to some sort of a Data Saver extension, so it's going to come. Uh, UC Browser's Cloud Boost, um, so with inside of uh, the main primary UC Browser, uh, you can enable this for mobile or Wi-Fi. And then Opera Turbo, which is actually a service that runs inside of many of Opera's products, including what I've got pictured here, which is Opera Max, which is kind of a cool service that um, tries to optimize all traffic from any app on your phone. So kind of cool, but also kind of freaky in a, if you're into the security, concerned about that. You've got to really trust Opera. Um, what these services do is they start to alter and play with things on the network level. So instead of routing it to the web server right away, all requests get routed through an intermediary level of servers first. So this is Opera servers, or this is Google servers, or UCs, whatever it happens to be. Those servers then make the request out and come back, and then they maybe do something to that asset, and maybe not, depending on what the asset is and what the settings are. Um, and then it passes all that stuff back to the device. 
Now this seems somewhat inefficient when you're looking at it like this way, but it's important to remember that while the initial request between the mobile device and those cloud servers are happening over potentially a mobile network, uh, the other stuff can happen over a very high bandwidth, low latency environment. So those requests can happen very quickly. And because they control that environment, they can actually do further optimizations on the network. So Google and Opera Turbo both use Speedy when possible, which was the basis for HTTP2, um, which lets them speed things up to about by 23%. Um, because of the way that it handles resource loading and things. Uh, so they're able to do this. I, I fully expect very shortly you'll see HTTP2 being used instead. Um, they're not doing anything with Speedy anymore. And basically, uh, Chrome's data saver is just using the page speed module. So as soon as HTTP2 hits the page speed module, it's going to hit here too. Um, so they do a lot to make sure that that second level doesn't really kill your performance. Um, and this lets them do things here in the middle level um, that they can ensure to like bring down the size of the data and kind of reduce the constraints on the network a bit. So they enable gzip if it's not enabled. Um, they will perform minification on CSS and JavaScript. Uh, they will do image compression and image transcoding in certain cases. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the biggest savers in terms of data are. It's also where you know the, the very visual those of us that are very visual and designers that tend to freak out sometimes with some of the compression things because they can look a little ugly. Uh, but basically these services have the ability to, the user gets to define how much compression they want on these images. They can have it you know, not compressed very much at all, so they're gonna get a high quality image, but they're gonna get a little more data, all the way to just turning off the images entirely. Um, those are the ones that really probably irk. Uh, but this is something the user controls. The user gets to define the level of the compression. Uh, for the transcoding, this is where the biggest gains are coming from Chrome's data savers and Opera Turbo, because they'll actually transcode a lot of images to WebP format. Um, so this is the Disney.com site. Uh, it's a responsive site, so it worked all right to show up on the desktop data saver stuff. Uh, but it's with data compression off, it's 5.4 megabytes, and with it on, it's all the way down to 1.6. Um, and it's largely because of all these images that are getting converted to image WebP format. So all of these things, and you see they're like ranging from, you know, 3.3K to 30K. You know, those are uh, big 80, 90, 100K images otherwise. Uh, but the transcoding enables them to really bring that size down. Um, basically think of these conservative ones as doing all the sorts of things that developers should be doing anyway. Like fixing things that developers are not doing right, probably. Um, there can be a little bit of a loss in quality with the transcoding as well, just going to web, uh, WebP format. Sometimes just certain formats of the images just don't look as sharp. Um, but again, the, the user has purposely opted into a service that does this for them. So you know, who are we to complain about that? Uh, these all behave fairly well. They didn't used to, um, but they've all behaved fairly well now in the most modern versions of them. Uh, so for example, there's a remote address header that people use for GeoIP location. Obviously, since it's routed through a different level of servers, that remote address changes. Uh, it is now like Google server's IP instead of your device, so the GeoIP would be broken. But they all pass this uh, X forwarded for header that you can use um, to get that information back. They each also add some additional things uh, to tell you that it was actually optimized by some service. Opera says, uh, using a content op that it was optimized by Turbo. Uh, Chrome uses Avaya, um, and you, UC uses some sort of proprietary UC browser UA thing, which they shove everything under the sun into. Um, there's a, a, a client hits is one of those things that gets discussed right now about this ability to give information about the device. This is sort of a non-standard precursor in a way. I mean, they're shoving logical resolution, pixel resolution, network information, like is it Wi-Fi, is it uh, just a mobile connection, is it offline? Um, original version, you know, operating system, is it in proxy mode, is it not night mode or not? They have a whole bunch of stuff they're flooding into here. Um, point being, they all give you some additional information to let you know something happened to your site. And because they're fairly conservative, there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of fallout from this. Um, you know, I mean, minification does remove comments in JavaScript CSS, and there are apparently some JavaScript systems that rely on commenting for some of their functionality. Um, the, this issue comes up every once in a while when it comes to these things, and I think the response from the engineers is always, why the hell are you doing that? Um, so but the solution would be don't rely on comments um, or use cache control no transform. Uh, this is a header you can apply to those files. Chrome, uh, even Chrome used to not obey this correctly. 
um, but they all are now. So if cache control no transform is applied, at least these major ones that I tested will leave the JavaScript and the CSS alone. They won't minify it anymore. Uh, so if you absolutely have to use comments, that's the way to do it. Uh, you know, images can be removed from a page. Uh, just provide a text fallback. Make sure you're using the appropriate attributes um, for all of these images so that it'll display basically a little box with the uh, alt attribute or title attribute in there. Um, you know, so it's a pretty easy thing to deal with. Um, you know, in the transcoding, you also get a lot of complaints about the blurriness of the images. Technically, yeah, you could use cache control and be like, don't transcode or compress this image, but boy, you better have a good reason for that. Um, there, I can't think of very many because, uh, again, the user has specifically said, I want you to degrade the quality of my image a little bit so I get some better data. So, like, who are we to argue with that? Um, it always helps at this point to kind of just take a deep breath and ask yourself if every site needs to look the same in every browser. Um, it's a great way of coping with this. Now, even though these are fairly conservative, the data savings are pretty good. Uh, Opera claims up to 50%, Chrome claims up to 50%, UC claims up to 60 I've used each of these um, as a primary uh, browser. I guess Opera was more the service running over it for the most part. But I use these primarily um, for a couple months each to try and get a feel for the actual data savings because it's a tough thing to test and verify. And I will say that in my experience, UC is a little overly optimistic here. Uh, and Chrome and Opera are a little conservative, actually. Uh, thanks to the WebP transcoding, um, the gains are actually a little bit higher than that. So that's the conservatives. Um, let's jump into the more aggressive ones, because that's where things get really interesting. And this is where people start throwing things, usually. Um, one way of viewing these is as uh, not as traditional browsers at all. It's remote browsing is the way that when I talk to Puffin CTO, this is the way he described it. And this is the way I kind of like to think about it, which you'll understand in a little bit why. They are focused on reducing the impact not on the network, not just on the network, but also on the device itself. They do the whole thing. Uh, so similarly, all requests get routed through some middle layer. That middle layer forwards it onto the web server. Here's where things differ. Instead of coming back and passing that request back to the mobile device right away, it stays there on that middle level. They get all the requests that they need to to create the page. They render it on the server, and then they pass something back to the client. Um, so all of these things, the parsing of the HTML and the CSS, the construction of the DOM, the rendering, the painting, the layout, it's all done in this little middle level of servers here. That's why it's remote browsing, because that the client on your device, is, uh, it's almost helpful to not think of it as a browser at all. It is just an app that takes some sort of proprietary format and displays it, and it just so happens that the proprietary format usually displays what was a web page. All the browser stuff is actually on the server. There's interesting implications of this. Um, so for one, any time anything changes that might impact the DOM or the rendering or the layout or the paint, you have to go back to the server. So if I've got a click event and I'm going to fire something on click or I've got an accordion or whatever it is, it has to go back to the server and figure out what has changed and then send something back to the device again. Um, you know, all of this stuff has to re-happen. Um, they do it in different ways. So in, it's because of their goals, which we'll get to. Uh, so OV Browser, Nokia Express, uh, UC Mini, and Opera Mini, when you go back to the server, they actually perform the entire thing. Like they create, um, they apply the changes, and then they recreate the snapshot, and they send back a full snapshot back to the client. Um, they don't, you know, they're not doing anything super smart here. They're just passing back a re-updated version of the snapshot down. So if you do something like, even using the mobilism uh, menu to just toggle down to the bottom of the page, it's firing back to the server, and then it kind of resnet generates and then sends it back to you. Um, Opera advises that you just think of it this way. Everything requires a user interaction, and everything requires a server round trip. I like to consider the goal as well, which is, the primary goal of these browsers is to limit the data consumed and limit the impact on the device. And if you keep that in mind, now whenever you're looking at what might work or what might not work on these browsers, it makes a lot more sense. Because if it doesn't do one of these things or it hurts one of these objectives, these browsers probably aren't going to do anything with it. They're probably going to leave those things out. So for example, the scroll event. A scroll event fires repeatedly as you're moving throughout a page or an element. Um, it is a constant, constantly firing. 
considering that everything has to go back to the server, if Opera Mini or UC Mini tried to support scroll, you'd have this constant going back and forth between the server, constantly trying to recreate the snapshot and pass it back. It would be completely unusable. Um, so something like this is out. They can't do this. Uh, in fact, a variety of events are out. Some of them are kind of legacy events and less important than others. But you, know, you get used to the fact that there are certain things that just aren't going, you aren't going to be able to do because they don't, they break from the model of what those browsers are trying to pull off. Um, they are also, because all the JavaScript is executed on the server, they have to have limits on how that JavaScript runs. They can't have things running perpetually on the server because you'd never get anything back. Uh, Opera Mini, since Opera Mini 5, um, has about a five second time limit on set timeout, which means that if you have a set timeout for like six seconds, it's not going to run. Uh, set interval, which means that let's say you're firing, you have something performing every one second, it's going to fire five times and that's it. It's not going to fire beyond that. And uh, you know, for AJAX stuff, if the request takes longer than five seconds to complete that AJAX functionality, it's not going to complete. Kind of unfortunate, but again, it, it fits in with what they're doing. Um, thankfully, though, uh, the thing is everybody has this sort of angst and, and, and stuff with Opera Mini because of how well known it is. But all you got to do is fire up UC Mini and you start feeling a lot better about Opera Mini. Uh, UC Mini executes the timeout immediately. Doesn't matter what you set it to. I, I tried to do you know, 500 milliseconds, a second, five seconds. 50 seconds, I eventually worked it up to like a minute and a half and it still was doing it instantaneously, whatever it was. So it appears to ignore the timeout value and just execute. Uh, set interval val uh, only executes once immediately, no matter what the interval is. So if you have like a really tiny little interval, it'll still only fire once. Um, with one exception, which we'll get to, which is kind of interesting. And Ajax seems to be slightly more aggressive than Opera Mini, um, it, maybe about a second. I can't pinpoint what it is. And, uh, Every time I, I talk to a few people on the UC team, but unfortunately everything that I asked them I was met with, we have a secrecy policy and we can't tell you that. So uh, this is the best I could come up with. Um, what's interesting about the set interval is if you actually do an uh, AJAX request, and let's say that this AJAX request, you send it to a, a dummy page that just has a sleep header for like two, three seconds to take up the time, the set interval will run while the HTML, while the AJAX request is executing. That doesn't happen. Uh, you can't hack things around otherwise, but that's, so if you want to get the interval to run for like up to three, four seconds, you really could technically do that, I guess, if you really needed to pull that off. Um, kind of building off of, uh, of Peep Gay's idea that there's no Chrome, um, there's also, you know, UC is all over the place. Um, UC Mini itself is actually two browsers in one. The default mode, the speed mode, the proxy stuff that we've been talking about, which is on the left, um, that's what the architecture we've been describing. If you turn speed mode off, it turns into just a, uh, a wrapper around a web view. Uh, so that's what you see on the, um, the right. Uh, so it's actually two browsers within one, depending on the setting that they're using. Now Puffin. Puffin, I, I like Puffin. I think Puffin's doing some really interesting things. Um, so they do things a little differently. Instead of doing a full snapshot, they, keep a they have a persistent connection between the device and the uh, cloud servers. And when something goes back, they actually apply the changes and then do a diff. They compare what's changed with what the original snapshot was, and they only pass back the diff of those changes. So their client has to be a little bit fatter. There's a little bit more inside of the application to make that work. But what this enables them to do is to provide a lot more traditional JavaScript interaction, more like what we're used to. It still requires the server round trip, but they can execute things a little bit quicker. Uh, their goal is slightly different. They want to limit the data, they want to limit the impact on the device, but they want to provide as close to an equal experience as a modern browser as they can. Um, they bring back certain events, so resize, scroll, mouse out, error, mouse move, those all fire within uh, Puffin browser. Uh, scroll is a little like they don't all fire the same way we expect. Like scroll doesn't fire constantly. Scroll fires as soon as the scroll event is finished, which again makes sense because you'd still have that, that back and forth, that constant back and forth. Um, so the behavior is a little different. I know that they are trying to find ways around this. Um, they're, that's, that, that's why their goal is, I mean, they're, they're so ambitious about trying to replicate the modern browser experience within a proxy browser environment. Um, they're not happy with how the scroll behavior is now and they're trying to find a way to hack around that and make it more like a typical uh, browser is. Um, 
Now, each of these all have their own rendering engines that they're using. Opera is using Presto. It was updated just recently to give you some REM and Flexbox support, which everybody was super excited about. Uh, Puffin is running Blink based on Chrome 30 at the moment. Uh, UC Mini uses a U2 kernel, which is their own fork of WebKit. Uh, they also have a U3 kernel, which is what they use on the full browser in Cloud Boost that has a little bit better support for things. Um, but it is their own fork of WebKit that they're doing. Uh, and then uh, the Nokia Express was based on Gecko. Um, this doesn't mean that you can expect that those rendering engines are going to behave like you're used to those rendering engines behaving elsewhere, because they do change things. Um, for example, these are some of the CSS and features that you cannot use on these uh, Devices, you know, border radius, with the exception of Puffin, uh, gradients, transitions, animations, JavaScript only APIs, font face. Um, and again, if you keep in mind that they want to limit the impact on the device and on the uh, network, it makes sense. Font face is notoriously heavy. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love it if all browsers actually stripped it. I, that's not, no. I, I live in an area where we don't have great connections, so font face kind of annoys me sometimes. But, um, you know, font face animations can't happen because you can't change those things on side of the device because it's not actually a browser. And because it's not actually a browser, things like border radius are out because to be able to give you the border radius, since it's not actually painting or anything on side of the screen, they would have to create a bitmap on the server and pass you back the bitmap, which then adds more overhead, which they're not going to do. Um, JavaScript only APIs kind of make sense, right? Because if all the execution is on the server, it's a very difficult thing. Not impossible. I wouldn't be surprised to see that kind of eventually happen, but a difficult thing to execute. Now, so far, all of this stuff kind of jives with their major goals um, and can kind of be explained away. Some of the stuff that's about to come up, though, um, can be a little bit of head scratching. So I do want to just say, if you have a weak stomach or like you just you get really unsettled by browser issues, you might want to, now would be a good time to head out there, buy a beer or something. If you have a beer or a drink next to you, now would be a good time to hold on to it uh, and just keep it close. I, I, I consulted with Sarah um, Swedeen. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of her last name, but she is a, a genius developer and one of the brightest people I know, and she's a SVG guru. And I was like, hey, I'm seeing some weird things here in UC Mini. Can you look at this? And, and she's like, sure. She's like, I have never used the browser, but I'll download it. So she downloaded it. And uh, she was, seemed super excited about downloading it. And then like two seconds later, she's like, oh my, what did you make me do? She's like, how did you, and she went on and on about how I ruined her day. And there was a lot of exclamation marks and question marks. And I felt really horrible after the fact. So this is what I'm going to do to you guys now. Um, so you see browser, right? So you see mini doesn't do icon, the font face. So there's no icon fonts, right? Opera mini doesn't either. And they're like, use SVG. Great. I love SVG. I think that's a great idea. Uh, so we're like, hey, UC Mini, do you support SVG? And they're like, yeah, we support SVG. Go ahead and use it. So we're like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? Um, as an aside, by the way, notice that they change all the bullet points to asterisks. I'm not sure what the heck that's all about, um, but they do. But so it says, hey, I support SVG, but it doesn't actually support SVG. Um, no matter if you use object, embed, inline, CSS, image, doesn't matter. So one of the common things that people have been doing the more popular front end techniques is to throw an on error, you know, handler on the image. So if it doesn't load the SVG, it'll fire the on error and you replace it with a ping. But that doesn't fire in UC Mini. Um, so we're kind of stuck in this, uh, this tough situation there. Um, so this is where we would go towards uh, user agents, right? Um, you know, this is a great purpose for user agents is to kind of fill those gaps that we don't have uh, information to. Um, and they do provide us information within the user agent string. And this is from Android, but um, this part is consistent. Whenever proxy mode is on, is that part all the way that you see web uh, across platform, it'll give you that sort of pattern. Uh, if you want to get at that on the client side, you would use navigator.useragent, right? But if you write out navigator.useragent, you actually get this, which has nothing to do with UC web. Um, so you have a couple options here. I mean, one you could do is you could go to the server and do some user agent detection there and, 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 you know, test for UC with the presence of UC web and serve up something different. Um, you could also use the sophisticated debugging technique that I developed over the last three, four months for proxy browsers, which is to drink under my desk until the pain goes away. Um, you know, you have, you have, op you have options at your disposal. Um, I actually think that one of the better ways of handling, though, is, is 
you know, what about cutting the mustard, right? This is this technique where we're using kind of a blunt, it's kind of a blunt force way of saying this is a modern browser and this is not. Um, and we do this, and local storage is not, you know, something that you see many can do, so this should be cool. But you ask them, and they're like, yeah, sure, I do that. Um, <laughs> So now you really cry. Um, but there's a way around it. As it turns out, you just got to get more aggressive with the local storage test. You can't just say, is it there? You have to set an item and try to get it. And can you actually do this? And if you can execute these things, then we'll say you cut the mustard. And if not, no. This actually works well. Um, if you use this sort of cutting the mustard approach like this, the UC uh, Mini in speed mode is going to be a non-mustard cutting browser, which you can then provide a simplified layout for. Um, so you have options. You can do this. You can use some user agent detection on the server, whatever works for you. Um, each of these proxy browsers also have these different display modes, which can be kind of tricky to understand. But you can logic most of the stuff away. Uh, Puffin has a request desktop thing. The way it behaves is they set the viewport to 1024. Um, and if it's an M dot, they explicitly you know, try to uh, get to the uh, desktop site. If it's a responsive site, they're just doing the viewport um, and then trying to apply there. Uh, but actually, I asked, um, so what happens if it's not 1024? Like, if it's a fixed site that happens to be a little wider? There's a whitelist. There's a whitelist that says this browser or this site is a little wider, so we'll give it a little bit more room. Uh, but the only way to get on the whitelist is to manually be added on by the Puffin team. So you have to report, and then they have to manually add you. So he's like, the best thing to do is use your viewport your main viewport and your responsive design. He's like, that'll give you, we respect that stuff and that'll display correctly. Um, that tricks it back into being kind of a normal browser mode. So it's actually not that tough to deal with unless you're doing some sort of fixed width thing, in which case just make sure it's under 1024, I guess. Um, there's a, a single column view, which is used by UC uh, Mini speed mode by default and Opera Mini, depending on the platform, it could be either default or something you opt into. The idea with single column view is that they want to ensure that everything within the page exists within a single column without any sort of horizontal scrolling. And so they'll rely on things like source order. Source order is hugely important in this because that's how they make the determination of how to fold those different bits of content in, uh, in a vertical line. Now, they do these both in, in different ways. Um, Opera Mini will strip out certain styles. You can see there's like padding that gets stripped out. Um, table elements sometimes get dis like display inline, like little table cells will go to inline instead. Things to make sure that things kind of stack up vertically. Um, it looks a little ugly, but for the most part, it's not too bad. Um, you can make it better, though, if you want, because they actually look for the handheld media attribute. So if you put it on your style sheets or you have a separate style sheet that you're providing with those basic styles with handheld, um, it will apply the handheld styles and give you something more like this. Um, I've, apparently, I've got to clean that navigation icon thing up because what the heck, but um, don't look at that. But uh, So it gets back to being a, a respectable view um, pretty easily because the whole point of the single column was primarily, you know, they wanted to be able to give people the full web experience instead of a stripped down mobile site. Um, but in able to do that, they felt like the better experience in these cases was to try and get it so that you didn't have to scroll all over the place. Um, but with a responsive site, with a viewport in place, you, it, it's not necessarily as big an issue. So they can just respect it and be done with it. So handheld helps. Um, you still have to watch a few things. Mobilism is an excellently built site, uh, and it uses the handheld attribute. But because there is a width on the speaker carousel, it actually pushes it out to about 900 pixel wide because it feels like it needs to account for the speaker, not the carousel, the speaker images, um, even though it's supposed to be cut off with overflow. Um, so always test these things still. UC Mini's a little nuts. They, 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 do thing, they strip out certain styles, including sometimes background. I can't figure out what the heck that's all about. But occasionally, you'll come across a site and like, the background colors will have changed and the fonts don't match up. It's really weird. Um, and their, their whole behavior is bizarre. They set the viewport to 1024. They apply all media queries, if it's a responsive site, all media queries up to that point. And then, they take this desktop responsive layout and they put it back into the 360 viewport or whatever it happened to be for your device in that single column mode. So it's like they start off with something that works, they apply a bunch of stuff, and then they push it back into something that they had originally. And so you get these really weird, uh, it, this is the resolution that they're defining, by the way, in their UA um, thing. And you get these really weird situations where now it's applying floats in things where there's no space for floats. Um, 
they don't, and they don't support handhelds, so there's no way around that. Um, from that perspective, this is again where you turn to either our old friend, the cutting the mustard test, or you go to the user agent string. Um, or even better yet, perhaps in the user agent string is looking for the UC browser UA and checking that value, the PM, which if it's on one, that means proxy mode is on. So you can get around it. Um, you just have to work at it a little bit. Now, so they're kind of a pain in the butt, but the value is there for the users. Data savings is up to 90% on most of them. Puffin's a little less because Puffin, again, has a slightly different goal. So they provide a lot of value to the users. And frankly, they're, they're, it's arguable how long the shelf life is on these things. Like They're going to be there for a little while. And they, I think they have a little bit of a, a window of kind of hopping onto this Internet of Things stuff. Uh, you know, the first official browser on a watch was Opera Mini. So when watchalism does come, we can, you know, talk about proxy browsers again. You know, Opera Mini managed to get into cars. UC's pushing heavy onto TVs. Talking to the Puffin team, they, they firmly believe that they have a future pushing TVs and watches and glasses in this next generation of connected devices that may or may not catch on and may or may not browsers. But they're all pretty well positioned for it because... They've figured out how to let low power devices, you know, access the web. You know, as Todd Parker from Filament recently pointed out, you know, the crappiest devices on the web right now have very similar specs to the stuff we're getting super excited about. Um, you know, so keep everything in mind when you're designing for these things. Um, there's a lot of weird bugs and weird nuances, but really when you're working on these things, if you keep a few principles in mind, it's not that bad. Like build with progressive enhancement, have solid clean markup, a good structure to your page. Uh, responsive design is a great strategy for helping you hit some of these places where they've got the weird modes and displays there. Avoid heavy JavaScript frameworks, things like Angular and, and the like. You know, you just, they really don't have a place on current mobile, let alone proxy. Um, Cut the mustard, you know, provide a simplified experience to devices. This helps you and the devices to the browsers and stuff that are more likely to benefit from it. Um, and when I look at these things, I realize that, like, this is the stuff I would advise for just building for the web in general, like building a more robust, resilient web. And I guess that's the takeaway is not necessarily to freak out about the proxy browsers, but kind of build responsibly for the web and let go of this feeling that we have the control. We had this illusion of control and this pretense that we used to own the experience, but it never really, we never did. It's the user's experience to control. Um, and we're giving more control to them through the proxy browsers and through new technologies and existing browsers. Um, you know, really the best advice on developing for proxy browsers that I can give comes from John Alsop in the DAO of Web Design back in 2000. And that's just, it begins by just letting go. Just letting go of control and being flexible. Thank you. That was timed quite well. Tim? It's two minutes over. I was... Is it two minutes over? Yeah, oh, I was hoping yeah. not to get pulled well, off. Let's buy some time so that, that I could set up the next one. Yeah. Um, did, did I hear you correctly that you said that uh, linking to a fragment causes round trip? Linking to a fragment? Yeah. So like, in, you know, an anchor in the page. Oh, it depends. If you have an event handler that's kind of assigned to anything related to that. So what's causing it in mobilism, actually, it's not necessarily the going to the bottom of the page within the anchor. Um, because it's just a simple go to bottom thing and go back to top. What it's actually stat counter in that case has an event that's um, watching, you know, clicking and stuff, and so it's causing the round trip. But if you're using anchor tags to like hide and reveal things using like focus or target, or I, mean, I should say, um, like I do on mine for my navigation, in that case, yeah, it does make a round trip, even though the, all that content's there because it needs to re, you know, paint and stuff. So um, developers want, let's say developers want to start, um, you know, targeting uh, proxy browsers or at least thinking about them more. What um, you talked about some tips, you mm -hmm. know, that will help things they're doing work better. But would you suggest like uh, starting like proxy browser first type thing or? Uh, uh, I wouldn't say proxy browser first. Um, I'd get in trouble from Luke, I think, from trying to do another first. Uh, no, I, you know, I think that it, the way that you, you approach building for the web in any way that makes uh, some sort of semblance of control is starting with that, that simplest experience um, and assuming making the least amount of assumptions possible and then enhancing on top of that. Like that's why you see you know, the, the, the simple layout that gets, and then you use like the media queries and stuff to enhance as you build up. You use hardcore feature detection. 
um, and things like that to kind of determine very carefully when you're going to enhance bits and pieces of the page. Like you start with the simplest possible version of that page and then you just enhance the experience for devices that can um, support it. So progressive enhancement. Yeah, yeah, basically. it's a revolutionary new concept that I don't think has ever been discussed before. Right, well, kind of related to that is a question we got. Um, what an appropriate fallback would be for icon fonts for, yeah. for um, say, Opera Mini. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I actually tend to, <laughs> it's tough. You, look, so here's the thing. Like, that gets into the, a lot of the discussion about, first off, should the icon be the only thing anyway that's giving the cue? Like, is the visual representation enough to, like, should there be some sort of text helper alongside of it? Um, it's tough because in, in, in certain, like UC Mini and stuff, you're not necessarily going to be able to test for that support unless you're actually trying to do a dynamic load of stuff. You know, like the try to load a itty bitty little font and change some little thing and see if it applied. Um, in which case you could, I guess, trigger like a, um, a, a, a little span or something that was hidden of helper text. Um, but I mean, it's the same thing. I basically view the icon fonts as an enhancement, start with some sort of a structure where it's text that's representing what that label is meant to imply, and then use the icon fonts on top of that like to layer on top. Um, so that if it's not there, it's going to fall back to the little label that's going to still be helpful. So you won't get the three, the, the little hamburger, but you'll get the word menu or something. So like basic accessibility yeah, practices. Yeah. yeah, that's good too. Accessibility, sorry. All right. Tim, thank you. Tim Cadley. Thanks.